since we're working on anger tonight. <laughs> and patience and compassion are two antidotes to anger. How about if we um, uh, do some chemising mantras together, just to set a good motivation and a good intention for tonight. And then we'll go on uh, to do the rest of the prayers on the page through the short mandala offering before we do. Om Mani Padme Om 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 Om Mani Padme I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha's Dharma and the Sangha. By the merit I create by engaging in generosity and the other far reaching practices, may I attain Buddhahood to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by engaging in generosity and the other far-reaching practices, may I attain Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I take refuge until I have awakened in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. By the merit I create by engaging in generosity and the other far-reaching practices, may I attain Buddha to benefit all sentient This ground, anointed with perfume, flowers strewn, Mount Meru, four lands, sun and moon, imagined as a good land and offered to you, may all beings enjoy this pure land. The objects of my attachment, aversion, and ignorance, friends, enemies, and strangers, body, wealth, and enjoyments, I offer these without any sense of loss. Please accept them with pleasure and inspire me and others to be free of the three poisonous attitudes. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam We were walking from that direction, this way, and Desmond pointed out, See, there's this Shantideva center. And at first I was looking over on this other building, and then this poof came into my view, and I had no idea it was on the corner. And there's this beautiful glow coming from the space, and it's so inviting. And so just, you know, several feet away, this, um, this feeling of warmth was coming out of the building. So you're doing something very good here. It's obvious, and that's just coming from my ordinary mind, you know, but it's so welcoming. And I can only see this place as uh, flourishing for the Dharma. So you've done a lot of hard work here. That's obvious, and we know something about building buildings at the Abbey. <laughs> and so I can really say from my own experience, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to a certain extent, and a lot of love, too, and a lot of commitment. So I just, I'm rejoicing in what you have out here. And what a beautiful place to have for people who are here in New York City, where um, you're really face to face with each other in this city, in a way that we aren't at the Abbey. There's 17 of us there right now. There's more than 12 million people here. So you've really got your work around you all day long. This book, 
and then we'll get to the formal talk in a minute. This is a book that was written by Venerable Churvin, and it was published, I think, in 2001. Something like that. And, let's see, yeah, 2001. So, of course, you know, when the book came out, I went and got a copy. Maybe you have a copy at home. And then I do what some of us do, you know, I sort of went on my bookshelf. <laughs> because I know all kinds of people who need this book. I know all kinds. They need to read this book. <laughs> Me, not so much. And so every now and then I, you know, look at it when I got into trouble, but I never really worked at the book. And then last year, um, we go into Spokane once a week. Two nuns go in from the Abbey, and we lead a meditation and a little teaching uh, session at the UU Church in Spokane. And, um, what's on? Okay. <laughs> we started working on this book in August, I think, or maybe July of 2017. And so every week we do a few pages with the group there. This group is largely not Buddhists. But there's a core group that shows up every week, so there's at least 50 people in the room. Mm -hmm. And at first, when, when they saw that we were going to do this book, they were just like, really? It's probably what you're thinking tonight, really? Could you have asked her to talk about something more interesting or fun, like Bodhicitta? You know, <laughs> <laughs> we have compassion as a talk for tonight. Really? Doesn't. Come on. <laughs> And this is the orientation of the group in Spokane for a number of months. It's like, oh, please, would you forget the book and leave it at home and let's do something else. But they've really hung in there. And the book is actually, I've discovered in doing it and really getting into it, it's a handbook for life. You don't have to be interested in Buddhism for this to be essential. And it's not a very big book, you know, there's only well, the glossary takes a few pages. There's 157 pages. That's it. There's 67 techniques in this book. 67 antidotes on how to work with anger in different situations. And so, you know, I bet if we got a handle on 10 of them in this book, we'd really be in good shape. I'll speak for myself. I'd be really in good shape. If I maybe get 30 of them in this life, I'd be thrilled. 30 antidotes to anger. And so it's a very, very useful book. And the whole reason for the book, I'm not going to steal the little children's thunder with this. I'll just give you the little, you know, blurb. Early on, uh, Lama Zopa Rinpoche and Lama Yeshe saw her potential as a young nun. They had her out the door and teaching in no time. In no time, they sent her to Italy, and she was going to be in charge of a number of monks that were at least twice her age. Now, do you think Italian monks were going to listen to a young American nun? Yeah. <laughs> so I think they gave her a really rough time. A really rough time. And they really uh, helped her see that she had some work to do with anger. Now, we all have work to do with anger. And I'll just speak for myself. It was re it's really too bad I left this book on the shelf as long as I did. I could have really saved myself a lot of prostrations and preparations. <laughs> <laughs> if I had really picked up the book when I first got it. But no, of course, I wasn't the one with the problem with anger. It's all the people I know. You know, the people I work with, my <coughs> boss, right, my dad. So, if you have that orientation tonight, I can assure you that this is a very friendly, useful book. It may make us squirm in moments, but that's the job of our teacher. That's the job of our you know, Dharma practice, to make us look and go, oh yeah, that's exactly what I do. That's really gross. <laughs> so it's really useful. And um, I'm gonna, my plan tonight is to share two chapters. We'll see how it goes. If I start losing my ground here, we'll just end. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to encourage you to, you know, speak up and share things too, so that this is more like a conversation tonight, and uh, we can help each other with our experience, because we all have experience with anger, and we all have experience with working with it and using antidotes. So that's the plan. So, 
Uh, why don't we start off with a few minutes of silence. We'll just get ourselves settled. <coughs> I'll set a short motivation, and then we'll, we'll take a look at these two chapters. Let's cultivate our motivation for our time together tonight. And there's so many things that we could be doing tonight in New York City. There's probably hundreds of plays, hundreds of concerts. We could have all gone to a very fantastic restaurant and spent the time chatting for hours and hours. The list is really endless, even if it isn't New York City. And yet in this life that is so short, we're taking the time to think about the Dharma, specifically from the point of view of how to work with anger, which is an affliction that we all grapple with. And just having an interest in the Dharma, wanting to cultivate our good qualities, and to work on reducing our afflicted mental states, even that is extraordinary. Something to be really, really cherished in ourselves and in others because it is really so rare. So as we think of the people that we're close to in our life right now, the suffering that we hear about daily in the media, and the reality that so few people have the tools to deal with the stress and the pressure of living in a modern world, how fortunate that we've created the karma First of all, be even slightly interested. And then in, in this incredible opportunity to meet teachers like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, everyone that you would consider a teacher for you, how fortunate. So let's rejoice in the time we have tonight. the teachings via a book written by Venerable Children, inspired by her many teachers, inspired by the Buddha, and be a support to one another as we continue to grow our capacity to have a kind heart and to truly care for others.
So what I thought I'd do tonight is a technique that Venerable Shurgan has been doing for years and years. Um, she does it actually almost all the time now. She does something that she calls slow reading. So I'm going to read from Working from Anger. I have the ebook version on my computer because my copy's falling apart. Um, the pages are coming out, and then I've got some other thoughts in front of me that I'll share with you. And uh, actually, Jeffrey Hopkins does the same thing. We get teaching with Jeffrey when he's around once a week via Skype, and he does the same thing. He'll have this text out, we read it slowly, he will give his comments on it, and it's a really good way of, you know, really getting into the text. So it's something that I find very useful. And why would I try and summarize something that Venerable Trigon has just laid out so beautifully? I couldn't even begin to do it. So that's going to be the plan. Um, I think I'm not alone in thinking that I don't have a problem with anger. At least that used to be my orientation. Does anyone else here think they do have a problem with anger? Do? Okay, so you're light years ahead of me. <laughs> so it's our human condition. You know, it's not just some of us, it's all of us. Some people maybe express it more visibly. You know, they're the exploder types. Even the imploder types, you know, we kind of know when someone's ticked off and they're stood in the way, we kind of know. Um, so I think we all realize that we have this predisposition to anger. But often, if unless we've done the work, we don't have the tools right in the moment. Yeah. Sorry, just to okay. the camera's on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> about 250 people on the plane, nobody lost it. You know, it looked for a while like, like we're going to spend the night in a chair in the Syracuse airport because we just weren't going anywhere. Everyone was fine. And even the pilot, when we got back on the plane finally, he said, wow, you, got, you guys are fantastic. Um, so, you know, when we have to, we can pull it together. You know, I mean, what are you going to do at all? What, what good would it do? losing it in that situation. I have in the past. Um, it just is embarrassing in the end. So, um, the one thing that I used to do that would mask my awareness that I was angry is I would say, yes, okay, there's occasions when I get angry, but all these other words that I use, that's not anger. So in my books, frustration didn't count Irritation didn't count. Being annoyed didn't count. What are some other synonyms for anger? They just didn't count. Ticked off. Cranky. Being cranky. Being grouchy. Irritable. <coughs> irritable. Mm -hmm. irritable. I'm just irritable today. Those all didn't count. You know, I, I thought of anger as full-blown explosion. Right? That's, that's kind of what I thought, so I could find all these justifications for those other words. But they're all anger. And they all disturb our mind. Our mind. And when we're really honest, anger, if this is our purview when we're not angry, then we're not angry in every moment. You know, we're not. We have the seeds for anger in our mind 24-7. But it's not always up in our face. So, you know, if it's like this, when we're not angry, when we are angry, what I notice is my field of focus gets so narrow and skewed. But I'm convinced I'm right. And you're wrong. I'm convinced of that. So that's crazy thinking, isn't it? 
I mean, that's just crazy thinking. Unless you're angry and you're, you're not in the right. <laughs> so in the book, in the first chapter, uh, Venable talks about this forerunner to anger. And this is right in the first chapter, and I think it's really good to know about this men mental factor called inappropriate attention. Which now Venerable Children is choosing to translate, translate as distorted attention. You can pick the one that works the best for you. I think they're both pretty accurate. But so how does this work? So inappropriate attention. So we start noticing something and then we start really paying attention to it. You know? And we really pay attention to the fact that that tone of voice that that person has really bugs me. And the more I fixate on the fact that that kind of tone of voice bugs me, the more I'm going to be critical about whatever that person is going to say. It just gets more and more and more. And that's the point that we want to learn to catch in ourselves, the inappropriate attention. Right? So you come home after a day of work. On the way home, you're in the bus, you're on the subway, and you're wondering to yourself, did somebody at home do the dishes? Am I going to come home to a clean kitchen? I bet the dishes aren't done. I bet they're not done, and there's going to be food on the table like there is every day. And, you know, there's going to be leftovers in the fridge that should have been thrown out three weeks ago. So you get into the house, right? You open the door, and what's in the sink? Dirty dishes. That's the setup that we need to look for, right? We've already started that thinking. There's going to be dirty dishes in the sink. There might be one cup. This happens at the Abbey. There might be one cup. <laughs> it can be a major thing some days at the Abbey. <laughs> it's inappropriate attention, right? And so what helps me realize this is how I am about something I'm paying too much attention to when it's someone I'm really fond of. Right? So if it's so-and-so that leaves the dirty cup in the sink and I'm really fond of that person, oh, yeah, I know you're tired. Here, I'll go, I'll go and take care of that dirty cup. I'll wash it. It's all right. But if it's Desmond... <laughs> you know, Desmond has his act together. He knows better to leave that dirty cup in the sink. It's like, ticked off that you left that dirty cup in the sink. You know, how inconsiderate. You know I have a full day. So it can be dirty socks. It can be just about everything, right? And it's that inappropriate attention. We're already set to watch for it. And we make it bigger and bigger and bigger. But if it's our dear one, that hour, the dear one can change categories, right? The dear one can fit into the other category in just a heartbeat. That, that's a big warning sign. That's one, one thing to watch for in the first chapter. And then the other thing with this inappropriate attention, I don't know about you, but every now and then I go through phases of thinking that I'm pretty intuitive, pretty sensitive, and I can mind read. <laughs> Those combinations are like a Molotov cocktail. <laughs> you want to have a happy life. So we have this orientation that, you know, someone comes in tonight, right? I'm meeting them for the first time. And if my mind thinks they're maybe not too happy to see me, I can start thinking of all kinds of reasons why they're not happy to see me. Maybe they thought it was little children coming. I'd be disappointed too. <laughs> I thought that my children was coming from the Abbey. <laughs> you know, so we start making all these stories in our mind because we think we're so sensitive, we're intuitive, and we're looking at someone's expression. We forget the fact that maybe they're experiencing a little moment of gas, right? <laughs> they might have an expression on their face because they're uncomfortable. You know. And then we start making all these stories about why that person doesn't like me. And then we, every time we encounter that person, because we think that that person doesn't like me, they can say, 
or not seek, here's the critical thing. And then we'll point to something book. <coughs> Someone doesn't say hello to you. They just walk past you in the morning. Maybe it's someone at work. Maybe it's someone here at the center. They don't say anything. They just walk by. Like, mm. <laughs> right? And then we try to figure out why is it they don't like me? Was it because of this? Was it because of that? And then every time we meet, there's this growing tension. Right? It's based on one moment of interpreting someone's facial expression. Venable tells a really good story that I'm going to share with you that it really captures this and I never forget this story that illustrates this so beautifully. Maybe you've heard it, but it's worth hearing again. This was when Venable was still uh, teaching in Seattle and one of our students had this experience. So this is a true story. I think they're on the bus and uh, they were sitting midway on the bus, and at the back of the bus was this family, and it was a dad with his three kids. And the kids were just out of control. They were screaming and yelling and slugging each other and running up and down the aisle of the bus. And the dad was just kind of sitting there, you know, like this. He wasn't doing anything for the whole bus ride. <coughs> and then, you know, finally the family gets off and they were disturbing the people on the bus for quite, it was quite a long route that they were on, I guess. And finally, the family gets off and the venerable student got off and she was just doing something where she was pausing. She wasn't really trying to listen to what was going on with the family, but someone else came to meet the family. And so what was going on for that day for the family is that they had just been to the funeral of his wife, their mother, the kids, the dad, their mother had died. And everyone on the bus, of course, couldn't know this. And everyone was so critical. What a terrible parent. We should call social services. These kids are out of control. And that story just gets me every time that I start noticing I'm making a story in my mind based on something that I see. And I start interpreting this look. And we actually, I'll just speak for myself, have no clue what's going on with other people until we actually sit down and talk to them and get some more information. So I don't know if you have days like that where you you make an assumption about someone, how they interact with you, and then we take the story from there. We're, make, we're making films in our mind, and it's just not true. So I think it's a great, a great example of how we, we go off on tangents in our mind. So in the book, Venom Children makes a very wise point. And I'm just going to talk from my own orientation right now, if it applies to great, if not. Um, but you know, every now and then I think we think that we don't need some of these practices. Like, this is probably just for beginners, this book. <laughs> like, I know, I know this stuff. It's just for beginners. I want to get to Tantra. <laughs> <laughs> to really high practices. I don't want to waste my time with this stuff, you know, I'm, I'm more than that. But as she says in the book, you know, before we're able to use, get to really sophisticated practices, uh, we really have to look at what's getting, getting in the way of cultivating our wisdom. We can't even begin to develop bodhicitta, which is this aspiration to become a fully awakened Buddha so that we can be of benefit to all sentient beings. We can't even get there until we've got this under control. We can't. It's not going to happen. And so if we really want to be bodhisattvas, great. You know, we want to become Buddhas eventually. We really have to get this one. You know. We get, we've got to get it under control, and we're going to be working with this for a long, long time. I'll just tell you right now, it's not just this life. You know, it's not until we're about at the path of seeing where we've realized emptiness directly, 
we're really going to start cutting the roots to these afflicted mental states. And anger is a very um, potent negative mental state. We know that from our experience. And this is one that we can really get a handle on. We just have to do some work. And we have to be willing to admit, number one, that we do get angry. I think we can admit to that. And then we have to do the work of going to the cushion and implementing these antidotes. And doing the review of how things have gone in the day and then rerunning them with a different strategy. Because we have to rewire, we have to reorient our mind <coughs> to our habitual tendencies. And I think everyone here in the room will admit that we've got habitual tendencies that we just knee jerk to when things get intense. And eventually, we won't have that happening. And this is absolutely possible. How do I know this? Not from my own experience yet, but I see it in my teachers. And you've seen it in people who come here. You can see it. Their minds are very much more calm. They don't get upset in the face of big pressure. I mean, look at how His Holiness has lived his whole life. He's just a perfect example of this. So, the two chapters I'd like to get you really excited about tonight uh, are chapter two. I mean, every chapter is fantastic. But we're going to start with the disadvantages of anger. <coughs> because, in my experience, until I'm convinced of something, I'm simply not going to do anything about it. So, obviously, for a long time, I wasn't convinced that there were many, well, many, very many disadvantages to anger because I wasn't implementing any of these antidotes. And the other thing that I'm noticing this year, too, um, I'm not going to get this into a political talk, don't worry, <laughs> but since the election two years ago, people have been writing to the Abbey almost not at all. And they're asking, how do I work with my mind in this situation? How do I deal with this? And then not only the political scene, but also you know the tragedies that are happening way too often in this country and around the world. And so this book is very helpful for all of this. So Venom Trojan says this, anger may give us a tremendous sense of power but at the same time, it undermines the happiness of ourselves and others. As Gendru, the first Dalai Lama, said in a prayer to the female Buddha Tara, driven by the wind of inappropriate attention, amidst the tumult of smoke clouds of misconduct, <coughs> it has the power to burn down forests of positive potential. The fire of anger save us from this danger. So anger, as you've probably heard your teachers tell you again and again, really is a merit destroyer. It destroys our merit. And if you're not too sure about that, at the very least, you can just reflect on how you feel after you've gotten angry. I'm sure that there are sensations in your body that you're familiar with. We're unsettled for quite some time in our mind. We actually affect everyone around us, whether we'd like to admit it, admit it or not. And it's a big disruption, disruption in our practice. So what Venerable says in the very first sentence, and this is something that people will argue about why it's a good thing to get angry. Anger does give us this surge of energy. It gives us this sense of power, right? When we're really pumped about something, there's this huge huge adrenaline rush, <coughs> and that gives us the feeling that can convince us that anger is a good thing. Well, in your own experience, I think you can figure out the answer to that. This sense of power is really illusory, and it's really not a good power. Then she goes on to say, is anger accurate in its assessment of reality? Anger is inaccurate in its assessment of reality, because by definition, it is based on exaggeration or superimposition of negative qualities. However, when we are angry, we don't feel that we're exaggerating or superimposing anything. We feel that we're right. 
In fact, the angry mind seems to be very clear. I'm right, you're wrong, you need to change. She goes on to say, under the influence of anger, we select a few negative details and form a limited view that we are then reluctant to change. She goes on in this chapter and she tells this story, and I'm going to share this part of the book too because I think this is very, it's very accessible. We've all been here with this one. And it's a perfect, sim simple example of um, this thing about exaggerating what's going on. So, the story goes like this. Diana worked in the same organization as Harry. And although she didn't know him very well, they supported the same goals. One day, he cancelled a workshop she was scheduled to give. And feeling that his action had been unfair, she was very angry. For months, every time she saw him or heard his name, something inside her tightened. And then it occurred to her that based on a half hour of this person's 45 year life, she had formed an opinion of who he was that she was certain of and she was certain that this was correct. So half an hour, this guy's 45 years old. Right? He cancels her workshop. <clears throat> Surely she realized he is much more than this one unfortunate encounter that we had. Seeing that her anger was inaccurate, she let go of her fixed opinion of him. So since Diana no longer scowled at him, Harry became friendly to her, and eventually they were able to discuss and resolve the cancellation of the workshop. So, have you had an experience of that in your life? Somebody does something to you, and you think it's to you, and you interpret their motive, and then we put them in the enemy category. It can happen in minutes, sometimes in seconds. And I love the way Venerable says that. Based on this very small moment of time, we've summed up who that person is. And that's who they are. So in this case, Diana came to her senses rather quickly, I think. And then what goes on to say, holding on to and nurturing a fixed, inaccurate opinion of someone breeds suspicion and continual unhappiness. When we're mad at someone, everything he does appears wrong, and we take even the simplest act as more evidence that our negative view of him is correct. In the above example, every time Harry made eye contact with Diana, and greeted her, she thought he was ridiculing her. She thought he was taunting her because he had more power. In fact, he knew she was upset, and all he was trying to do was to create a friendly space in which she could talk to her about what had just happened. So this goes back to my earlier point about how we cut some people in our life a lot of slack and then some people we don't cut much slack at all. So we've got you know this much bandwidth for the person A and they can do the same, actually the identical things as person B who we give this much slack to. Just, just notice that next time you're cutting someone slack that you really like. And then notice if you can think of someone who does the exact same thing and how you don't have much bandwidth for it. It's really embarrassing and humbling to notice. But it's really humbling to notice. And then we can do something about it. She goes on to say this idea about refractory period. So we have different lengths of time with different emotions apparently. So during the refractory period when we're angry, obviously we know from our experience that we're close to any advice or reasonable interpretation that contradicts our view. We can neither think clearly about a situation nor accept other interpretations of it that well-meaning people offer. 
This refractory period may be short, maybe just a few seconds. Or it may last years or even decades. So you probably have the situation where, um, I'll speak for myself, I've had the situation where I've blown it with someone. You know, I did inappropriate language. I realize it right away. And then I try and find them. But I can see from the look on their face that it's really not the right time. So we have to be sensitive to when someone's ready to speak with us. And as you can see from this refractory period, it can be seconds, minutes, weeks, months, sadly years, really sadly decades. And I'll just give you an example from my own family, but I can't believe it happened to this day. But I'll give you the short version. Hopefully this didn't, hasn't happened in your family, but if it does, you'll have more skills to work with it. Um, so let's see. It was April of 2004. My brother finally decided to get married. It took him a long time. So we had a big family wedding. And relatives, our family used to be, there's a clue right there, our family used to be very close. We had a huge extended family. So, my future sister-in-law decided that at their wedding, they wouldn't invite kids. But they didn't tell the cousins in California, who were flying to Alberta, for the wedding, with their kids, that the kids weren't invited. Can you see where this is going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Weddings are supposed to be joyful and happy. <laughs> All of them that I went to until that one. <coughs> so the California cousins arrive at the wedding, um, their father, my mother's sister, knew about the arrangement. He was supposed to tell his children that his grandchildren weren't invited, but he thought there would be some kind of miracle, because, you know, we're Catholics. That <laughs> 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 there would be a miracle. But there would be a change of heart on my sister-in-law's part just before the wedding. <coughs> that wasn't going to happen. Mm -hmm. So they stayed for the ceremony, and then the California cousins bolted with my uncle, my mother's brother. And so that part of the family that had kids left the wedding. And then, um, I'll spare you all the boring details, but my, my mom's brother blamed my mother, for this whole thing. My mother that year had just had her second hip replacement. She was in her <coughs> 80s. And do you think that anyone can control what 40-year-olds do? These are 40-year-olds getting married. We're not talking about 19-year-olds. But my, my, brother, my uncle decided that it was my mother's fault that she should have used her maternal power to convince her future daughter-in-law to do things differently. The family fractured. That's all it took, just a wedding. But look, the wedding actually took about 15 minutes. This fracture resulted in my uncle and his side of the family not even coming to my parents' funerals. When they this has gone on since 2004, but there's a happy ending here. So, good news. I didn't go to this family reunion that took place this past summer, but my mom's side of the family got together. And my brother actually went to this, because he was also the person, right, who was the, the, the bad guy in this. Everyone got together. I, I just. I can't go to these things all the time. But they all got together and they were all talking to each other. And they, they went to celebrate my mom's sister's uh, 60th wedding anniversary with her husband. So, you know, it may take a long time, this refractory period. Hopefully in your families it doesn't take that long. But you know what? I think people are over it now. 
and the blame has stopped, I think. And people realize, you know, life is short, but it sure caused a lot of suffering and pain. And it was anger that people were hanging on to like a vice grip, with a vice grip. So, refractory periods, hopefully they're short. If we're on the receiving side of someone who wants to apologize us, to us, it's really our job as practitioners to work on that refractory period ourselves and make ourselves, you know, in a reasonable amount of time where we can work through what we're working through with this situation. You know, that we are doing our bit to be available. That really is our job, I think. Okay. So then in this chapter, talking about the disadvantages of anger, and talking about how we are not assessing things realistically, Venerable Children points out that, and I think we do this for most of the day until we catch ourselves, we're viewing life through the lens of me, I, my, and mine. It's really embarrassing. <coughs> But it's really often where I catch myself. <coughs> I, me, and mine. And she says, although we think that the way a situation appears to us is how it really exists out there objectively, when we're angry, we are in fact viewing it through the filter of our self-centered thinking. For example, if the manager criticizes my colleague, I may not get angry. In fact, I may even console my colleague and say things to him or her like, oh, you know, you shouldn't take what the boss is saying personally. You know, it's not a big deal. He's just under a lot of pressure. He's just venting right now. It doesn't have anything to do with you. And, you know, he'll be different tomorrow. But if the manager criticizes me, I'll likely be upset. So the situation appears extremely serious to me. I dismiss anything my friends might say and dig myself in more deeply into a hostile hole. Actually, she says, no, different ex no difference exists in the words the manager said to my colleague and to me. Why then uh, am I upset when he looks at me while speaking, but not when he looks at my colleague? So, I think we've all had the experience of being the coach to someone, right? We're consoling someone, they're bent out of shape, they're really upset. Maybe it was their spouse who said it, maybe it was their boss, maybe it was their best friend. <coughs> We're just, you know, doing our, sharing our Buddhist wisdom and pointing out the fact, you know, you just, you know, look at the suffering of the other person. Look at how miserable they are when they speak to you in this way. They're suffering. You know, we, there's just no need to take it personally. We can do that when it's being directed at them from the client. And then when the person lights into me, it's like, it's, it's just a tragedy. I'm just heartbroken, right? It's just, how could you say those words to me? And, and so it's just very interesting how, you know, we can have a grip on the teachings in moments, and we've really got it together for someone else. I can really be a good friend to you and just point out how you know, that person really should be the object of your compassion. You shouldn't be upset. <laughs> <laughs> and when it's directed at me, different story. So these are all kinds of things that we can take to the meditation cushion and look at. And then if you start getting a little bit um, overly critical, um, maybe take a break from this book and do a, another series of teachings where you can have compassion for yourself. Because sometimes, I think, 
we can get overzealous in our self-analysis um, and how we're doing, and we might not cut ourselves much slack. In fact, we might be really harsh on ourselves, and every time we get angry or we make a little mistake, we're just beating ourselves with a stick, and there's just absolutely no self-compassion at all. Well, that's another ditch to watch out for. Okay. Often people will write in to the Abbey, and I'm receiving these emails because I work in the office, or people in talks will say, so they'll hear all this, the disadvantages of anger, and they'll say, yes, but. So I'd like to hear from you right now, your yes, buts about anger. Do you have some? <laughs> Do you have any reasons that you think anger is beneficial? Where you, you hear about the reasons, you know, we're, we're harming ourselves, we're harming others, but... Um, many years ago I used to uh, attend a school and a number of the teachers there, the professors, followed this philosophy that actually, should I be talking in this thing? <laughs> so I had this one teacher who believed that anger was um, not only justified, but it was actually important, and that it was only um, by, uh, that you could actually use your anger to effect change in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, these were people who were activists. So you, you know, they said, actually, what you're doing is you're getting in touch with your anger, and you're harnessing it, and you're using it to effect change. Mm -hmm. So that, I did not agree with that point of view, and we had discussions about it, but it was, I didn't really, I didn't have her book. <laughs> you know? But she really did believe this wholeheartedly. Yeah. yeah. This is a very common view. This is very common. Um, people think that it gives them the energy that they need to act. Mm -hmm. And that from that point of view, change will happen. She also believed that the anger shows you that there's something wrong. And exactly. that something needs to be changed. Right. But what I hear, yes. Did you want to add to that? I, I just noticed. Uh, I just happened to notice uh, uh, latching on the activist uh, comment that um, a lot of times this usefulness of anger is utilized as an excuse to hide. Mm -hmm. So, what well, I understand that, uh, that anger can uh, riled up the energy necessary for activists to get out there and act. I often come across situations when I read about it and I realize that it's utilized as an excuse, like some sort of a mask. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was just angry. Mm -hmm. You know where I'm going with this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a very common view. <laughs> I think it's also important to distinguish between anger and wrath. I think that like from the point of view of an activist, if you're acting from a point of wrath where there's not attachment and this need or yeah, I think that the way that anger can manifest itself can be similar to wrath. But wrath, you're approaching it without attachment, and that can be useful and beneficial in moving things forward and helping people, as opposed to approaching, approaching something from attachment and anger and rage. So I'm not too sure your meaning of wrath. Thank you. Right. Um, I guess the best way for me to describe it would be probably through an experience. So it in my experience of feeling as though I manifested wrath was my desire to stop somebody from harming someone else. And it wasn't my necessary, my necessary attachment to the people in the situation, but also just genuine compassion for 
their, that person's anger, them hurting someone else, that other person being hurt as well, and just the misguided attachment in the situation that the two people were experiencing. So it appeared as though I were angry and getting involved, but it was just to make sure that they would stop. So you had to be very forceful. Um, yeah, and I'm usually very laid <coughs> back, so it was it was odd for me to be very forceful. But I I wasn't angry. It was more so like a genuine concern mm -hmm. that, and I had to be loud, <laughs> you know. But it was yeah. So I would agree. I think we can be loud. I think we can be forceful. I think we can be very clear, and not be angry. And I think when people don't have enough resources in their toolkit, and we're all building our toolkits, you know, um, I think the more we reflect on the disadvantages of anger, I think we can know when things are wrong and not be angry. I'm convinced <coughs> of that. And then if we're really honest with ourselves and we really look at how we are when we're angry, do we have that wide view that's so, you know, comprehensive of the situation? Anger is an afflicted mental state. And it really is narrowing our view. And it often is fueled by self-centered thinking. And we lose perspective. And I really truly think there's a place for energy and clarity and forcefulness but I think the minute that anger sneaks in there, we're afflicted and we're in trouble. And then people do and say things, just, you know, tonight when you get home, just think about how you are when you're angry and what comes after that. Probably, in my experience, it's regret, right? I say and do things that have harmed others and myself. I have exaggerated the situation tremendously, and I have just lost touch with what's going on. So, with your, your description of wrath, yes, I, I think that's, that's true, and it doesn't sound like anger. But people always ask this question, you know, how do I know then if something's wrong? I think we do know. Anger is not a valuable gauge. But it might be for some people what actually gets them looking. Now, am I saying that tonight that we're all, you know, we should shoot to not be angry by this time next year? Well, I hope that's true for you, but it's not going to happen for me. And it's going to take us a long time to really, you know, get a handle on this. But if we're going to always justify our reactions, our angry ones as being suitable and appropriate for the situation, and this is what is needed, I think it's misguided. Mm -hmm. oh. <coughs> I was thinking the same thing that Lorenz said about change and, and getting angry and feeling. I, I have personally felt that anger didn't motivate me to do certain things. But I see what you're saying, maybe by being forceful and taking an action doesn't necessarily mean you're angry. Well, you'd only know for yourself yeah. from your own motivation. Mm -hmm. You know, we can get very angry about things. I'll be honest, it's going to get a little bit political. Yeah. Just <laughs> <gonna> get... <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> when I heard that the person who has the position of leading our country right now said two weeks ago that people who are throwing stones at the Mexican and U.S. border, if they do that, then that justifies the U.S. government, military, to shoot. I was enraged. I was enraged. I was so angry. Had I written a letter that day from that point of view, do you think it would have been effective? Well, I'll just speak for my own. It would have been a very poorly crafted letter. 
no one would pay attention to it. So we're going to get angry about things, but I think we cannot act from that place. You know, settle ourselves down, talk to a friend, figure out ways of getting engaged. His Holiness the Dalai Lama is telling us that prayer is not enough. So yes, for sure, we have to pray, but we have to get engaged. But we have to do it when we've calmed ourselves down and we're in a balanced place. <coughs> so maybe it's true. Some personalities will get fired up. Anger will let them know, this really matters to me. But we then have to use the skills in this book to get that settled down and get clear. Because when we're angry, check it out in your own experience. I know I'm not clear. In the moments of anger, I think I'm totally clear. But then, you know, you let a few days pass and things settle down and you get rational again. Then you can look back at that former self with compassion that was so angry, right? And see that there was really narrow thinking going on there. Um, so this is so timely for me, uh, an incident that just happened today, um, where anger that seemed justified. So my mom, who's 95, uh, moved a month ago into a nursing home, and it's been a big transition for both me and my mom. I don't think I'll cry, but anyway, there were some things that I saw. Uh, so yesterday was her 95th birthday, and I spent a lot of time from the night before, and got to see what's going on with the care at, you know, kind of at the ground level of, with the kind of aids that she has there. And um, I was very upset by some things that I saw. Details don't matter, but, um, so I didn't sleep much last night and I started composing um, different factual things that I was going to send, because I was really scared that she was going to be allowed to fall because of lack of skill or whatever going on. So I composed uh, different letters, and but the main one, <clears throat> with, with mostly facts, and I reviewed it a lot last night and this morning, I ended it with, um, um, we will hold Methodist home liable, um, right, if, if my mother is injured or falls. You know, and it took, but I didn't just send it, I reviewed it with her private care manager and with her estate lawyer, and they both said, hmm, the rest of it is really great, but that is, that aggressive, defensive, that, that just ramps it up. You know, and I, I really, you know, I have more thinking to do about it, but it took me a while to see it, um, but there was anger and fear underneath mm -hmm. and, it, and and really without that sentence it said everything that needed to be said but it didn't you know put a punch into it mm -hmm. so um you know it's things that can look so subtle to me i don't even see them but to somebody else you know it looks so obvious mm -hmm. so thank you yeah thank you it's a fantastic example and how fortunate you got some other eyes on that before you hit the send button or yeah. the letter. I was just going to make a quick comment that, you know, that as a lawyer, we call those demand letters. We don't call them like request letters or easily <laughs> <laughs> we just no, no, no. demand letters. <laughs> the point is, like, it's an aggressive sort of act that you take. Yeah. I can totally sympathize. Both of my parents went down the road of dementia. Mm -hmm. May your parents not have that experience. Mm -hmm. And I just lost it one time. I didn't have the friendly eyes. And I wrote to the family doctor because he prescribed some medicine for my mom. Um, it was an antipsychotic that she didn't even need to be on. It was the wrong dosage. It just about killed her. And I was stressed from trying to care for both parents right from the get-go. I was the one that gave her the pill because mm -hmm. this family doctor said this will help her. And she just about died. 
and I just lost it. And I took my parents to a geriatric psychiatrist who backed up my point of view right on that. I took it wrong. And I wrote this letter. Oh, I should have had someone else read that letter. I thought I was being so calm. The upshot was the family doctor quit on us. Now, I, later I showed um, some other people the letter and they said, you should have sent that letter. Well, I don't know. The doctor quit. I think the doctor was terrified I was going to take him to the college in Canada and that he'd lose his license. But I wrote from an angry place because I was terrified and I was deeply upset. <coughs> don't ever hit the send button when you're in that shape. I'm sure I'm telling you all of you know. I'm venerable. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the difference between responding from anger and responding from a sense of alarm. Um, the story that you told about the um, about the uh, um, uh, people throwing stones and then the response of the shooting. Um, yes, I felt a little bit of anger there, but I also felt a lot of alarm, just fear about first of all the kids, you know, who would be hurt, and then also about just, you know, the general state of, you know, the human condition that we're in, that we're in this state right now where we have to, where we have to think about this. And I was wondering, as I was thinking about the, the story, whether or not um, um, responding from the state of alarm is, might be similar to anger, but may not have that same kind of bite that anger has, and that would enable one to come down to, um, a sense of a reasonable response rather than the kind of constricted response that anger that anger has. I think what uh, I really appreciate about the way you asked this question just now, Richard, is that you use the phrase sense of alarm. That right away in my body and mind feels very different than really angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so from that sense of alarm, then, you know, all of our, well, venerable children in particular, because she's echoing what His Holiness says. You know, his Holiness is saying, this is a time for us to be responsible and engaged. He constantly is saying that message. So this is the time where, you know, we have these reactions that we have. In your sense, you know, you say, said it nicely. I really like that sense of alarm. Uh, we then get out the pen and paper. We call our government people. We make it known that this is not acceptable. Like, this is not acceptable how we're treating other people. This is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. And we get all of our politicians engaged and let them know, you know, really fill their, you know, inboxes and their voice messages with these voices of concern. And just do what we can as citizens to, you know, Express, let them know. I don't just, know it just seems that it just seems that that that, that seems to, you know it's it, it's also a stress. Anger is very stress. At least it is for me. Anger is very stressful, and um, I think one of the major disadvantages that, to to some extent, a little extent, I've learned is that that stress is really something I don't want. So anything that I can do to avoid it is great. Alarm is also stressful, but it seems as if um, the, the, the sense is that, like, there's a problem here, I've got to address it, I've got to fix it, um, how do I fix it, you know? Um, I, you know, you can go into panic if you're in a state of alarm, um, but what you can also do is go the other way and say, this is a way, this is kind of a call to action, this is kind of like a way for me to say, all right, well, I've got to write, I've got terrible handwriting, but I'm going to write 60 postcards for Beta, you know, and do something like that, rather than, rather than acting out of anger, which I don't think I could even do, because my handwriting would be completely <laughs> illegible. You know? So I, I, I think that, you know, I, I, just when you were talking about that, I was thinking about it, I haven't really formulated it much further than that, but I thought it might be something worth mentioning. The other thing that strikes me when I hear sense of alarm, Please join in, you know, if you've got some ideas about this. Sense of alarm to me says you're concerned about someone else. The focus is on the other person. When we're angry, where's the focus? 
That's exactly the point. I agree hundred percent. So I think I mean that's a very helpful phrase for me. So thank you. That's very good. Let me tell you what Daryl Children says about is anger beneficial? You probably know. <laughs> yeah. We generally consider something beneficial if it promotes happiness. But when we ask ourselves, am I happy when I'm angry? The answer is undoubtedly no. We may feel a surge of physical energy due to physiological reasons, but emotionally we feel miserable. Thus, from our own experience, we can see that anger does not promote happiness. You may say, why are you reading something that is so painfully obvious? Because I have to. I have to read it for myself even when it's painfully obvious. In addition, she says, we don't communicate well when we're angry. We may speak loudly as if the other person were hard of hearing, or repeat what we say as if the person had a bad memory. But this is not communication. Good communication involves expressing ourselves in a way that the other person understands. It is not simply dumping our feelings on the other person. If we scream, others tune us out. And in the same way, we block out the meaning of words when someone yells at us. Good communication also includes expressing our feelings and thoughts with words and gestures and examples that make sense to the other person. Under the sway of anger, as we all know, we neither express ourselves calmly or clearly. And then, as we all know, under the influence of anger, we also say and do things we later regret. And this is the, the part that is so impactful for me, and we know this. Years of trust built with great effort can be quickly damaged by a few moments of uncontrolled anger. In a bout of anger, we treat the people we love the most in a way that we would never treat a, st a stranger. We say horrible things, cruel things, or even physically strike those dearest to us. This harms not only our loved ones, but also ourselves, as we sit aghast as the family we cherish disintegrates. This in turn breeds guilt and self-hatred, which immobilizes us and further harms our relationships and ourselves. If we could tame our anger, such painful consequences <coughs> could be avoided. So the chapter goes on and on with the list of disadvantages for anger. The interesting thing is, when you look at this, there's nothing new here. But what we need to do with this kind of book, which I've found so helpful, is you pull out each of the disadvantages. You write it down. You know, don't use your computer. You know, we're so good. I don't know if you've noticed this. We do all sorts of things. And it kind of goes, um, maybe from here, I don't know how it works. <laughs> but this part is missed out. You know, there's some kind of disconnect there. Interestingly enough, when you get a pen and paper, and they've done research on this too, it's very interesting. Pen and paper, there's more of a connect here. So, you know, it's really helpful to look at the disadvantages. We're going to do a little bit of meditation in a while. We're going to focus on this. Pull out the disadvantages one by one. Put them on a list. Put them by your table where you sit and meditate. At the end of the day, go through the list and see, you know, how did I do today? Oh, that came up again. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm looking at the time, and it says on my clock it's only 628. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't even get to chapter 9, which is on knowing our buttons. Maybe I'll just, do, how about this? I'll just do a couple of things from that chapter. It's a great chapter. And then we'll do a little bit of meditation. We'll have time for some comments, and then I think that's it. So, chapter 9 is all about. Um, knowing what our buttons are. So we can say to ourselves, yes, I have a problem with anger. So do you. 
<laughs> but until we get really specific about what our buttons are, it's kind of like we're not really getting down to it. So let me just try and find this here. It's much easier than a hard copy book, but I don't have my glasses. So. Reading glasses if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> I might take you up on that. <laughs> okay. Alright. I have way more material here than I, I'm going to get to So in chapter 9, Venable was asking us to look at our buttons, and basically this is just identifying what specifically gets us set off. You know, and we all have buttons, they're all different, we might have some similar buttons. Um, there's a story here, it's a really good example. Is anyone in the room parents? Parents? Yeah. You got kids? Parents. You got kids? Okay. Anybody here an aunt or an uncle? Okay. Anybody who know kids? <laughs> All right. I think this, this story, and these stories in this book too are told to Venable by her students. So these are real stories. They're not made up. And this one really is really uh, accessible. It's such a simple story. And you can see how this woman, Helen, got herself into trouble so easily. Um, and it all boils down to our self-centered thinking. So, there's this woman, Helen. She prides herself on being a good mother. Mothers do, right? You don't want to be a bad mother. She dearly loved her child. She was conscientious about her child's safety and made sure she had many opportunities to learn and play. And because the preschool was just a few blocks away, Helen would occasionally ask friends to pick up her daughter when they were passing by. Even if a friend didn't have a car seat, Helen didn't worry, because the drive was just so short. One day, when her friend Carlene was coming to visit, Helen asked her to pick up her child on the way, and Carlene said, Helen, I can't do that. I don't have a car seat in my car. We mothers must be informed. And an informed mother knows that a young child never rides in a car without a car seat. So Helen interpreted this, of course, informed mother, to mean that she was a lousy mother, right? Good mother, obviously she wasn't, and she was deeply offended by Carlene's insinuations. And Helen brooded on this for several days until she realized her hypersensitivity and was responsible for her mood. And she thought to herself, now I think, I think Helen's a practitioner. Carlene and I have different opinions, and that's fine. Not everyone needs to have the same idea about car seats. I feel that I'm informed, and my decision is reasonable. I know that I care for my child properly. There's no reason for me to take Carlene's remark personally, thinking that a mere difference of opinions means I'm a negligent mother. She let go of her sullenness and felt confident again. So, I'm, not, I'm going to ask you tonight to think about some buttons that you have. What gets you going into knee-jerk reality anger? And I'll tell you one of mine. It's, um, I don't think I'm quite over it yet. But it always, I always fall for it. It's just so embarrassing because I know I have this. So, if someone says to me, well, I'll, I'll just give you an example. I'll ask someone a question because I don't know how to do something. And, you know, right away when you ask a question and you don't know how to do something, you're putting yourself out there and being vulnerable, right? And uh, so, sometimes I'll get the answer in what I hear to be a rhetorical remark. It'll be, 
usually like, well, what do you think? You know, I'm thinking, I ask the question, I don't know how to do this, what do you mean, what do you think? <laughs> Are you saying that because you think, oh, don't call me stupid. <laughs> don't call me stupid. Then it goes from there. You know, communication is no longer happening. But based on the way the person says, what do you think? I think I'm being judged. And that they're thinking, I'm just stupid. I fall for it so often. I know I even know to watch for it with some people, because I know they're going to say, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I still get to go, it's just embarrassing. <laughs> so we all have buttons. So right now, I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor. <laughs> you can think about it for a minute. Do you have a button that you know of that immediately gets you going and you're going to get angry? We don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to give you a time limit. We've got one minute. <laughs> okay. Because then I'm going to make a mistake. Yeah. So I'd rather just do things at my pace and not be pushed through life. Yeah. And our other What's one. Your point? <laughs> <laughs> our other one was a shared one of um, shared spaces and hygiene and cleanliness. So oh. not spitting on the street or littering or putting your nails on the side. And Melvin is mentioning one that there's just no time tonight to get to. This is a big one. There's a whole chapter on this. Thanks, Melvin. Um, I, I was just uh, saying most of my anger is um, pointed toward me and like the things that I do imperfectly, or if I do something, I forget something, or whatever. So most, like 99% of the time, my buttons are you know, things that I haven't learned to do well or, or something along those lines. Um, it's hard for me to, to, it's hard for me to put it into words and you know, that pisses me off. But, um, sorry. Um, so, yeah, that's, so it's, um, it's, it's less about what other people are doing and more about my, um, my actions and or inactions. Or, mm -hmm. like, One that's come up uh, quite a lot as I'm working with the nursing home stuff is um, not being in control. That if it doesn't go my way and I'm in control, and I'm just noticing that that's a thread so strongly, it's really embarrassing to see all the versions that that can take. Or the E4000. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Connect to the dealing with issues with a touch of humor too. 
Mm. Um, when I was uh, working before I retired, something that always uh, hit the switch for me was going to the bathroom and see the people urinate and don't flush. Mm -hmm. And I would ask myself, but why? It takes two seconds. Mm -hmm. How am I going to tell my employees that they need to behave better about this? You know, without offending them and without creating a scene. Mm -hmm. So I devised a little sign that I hang on top of the toilet that everybody would look at while they were, you know, doing it. <laughs> that literally said, um, I have a question to ask you. <laughs> do you ever spend a second thinking about all the things I do for you? I literally take all your shit and I ingest it all the time and I never complain. Could you be so kind and help me not get upset and flush? Because you know, if I get upset, I might suddenly have to throw up all that you gave me. And it ain't gonna be a pretty scene. A sign, we love your toilet. <laughs> it works. It's a topic at the Abbey, too. I've got a lot of signs. Love that one. No? Okay. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, I think we'll do a little bit of meditation right now. We're going to look at the disadvantages of anger. And with this meditation, you can just bring to mind situations from your life. And, um, so get yourself into a comfortable position. Most important to have an upright spine. Right hand in your left with thumbs touching, if you care to. You can lower your eyes, but don't close them because usually that leads to drowsiness. So have enough light coming in that you're feeling mentally alert, but you're not looking at something ahead of you or in front. So we're going to look at the disadvantages of anger. And this is actually one of the antidotes by reflecting on this. So let's consider this. because actually we created the cause in the past by harming others. And so, therefore, why be angry with the other person? So right now, bring to mind a time in your life where someone became angry with you or they treated you in a way that you felt was disrespectful, maybe it was very rude, <clears throat> maybe they really hurt your feelings. And let's use our Buddhist perspective now. That person is actually treating me in this way because I created the cause for this in the past. It's only my self-centered thinking, thinking and afflicted mental states that are to blame. It is not the other person.
sido bueno en el mundo. What's going on in my body? And what's the state of my mind? And now bring to mind a time where you became angry with another person. <clears throat> Try and recall the situation as clearly as you can. What did you say? What did you do? What was the tone of your voice? What was the other person's response? Now, looking at the situation with our older and wiser mind, even if the situation happened earlier today, maybe it was a situation from a year ago, with this mind that's older and wiser, because our mind is constantly changing, we can look back at the situation and have compassion for ourselves. This was our younger self. And we did what we did out of habit. And we recognize that it's not something we want to continue doing. Because we see the harm that it brings to ourselves and others. So let's take a few moments to replay the scene. We fully understand why, at the time, we became angry. But let's redo the scenario now where we respond in a softer and gentler way. Or maybe we say nothing. And that doesn't mean we stuff it. It means that maybe we're giving the other person time to explain him or herself. Maybe we tell the person, I need to take a break right now. And let's get back together again and discuss this when we're both calm.
take a moment to imagine how the conversation can go when both, both parties are calm. What can you express to the other person? demonstrates your, your care for him or her and gets to the issue at hand with kindness. Sometimes it's just a matter of slowing everything down. Sometimes it's a matter of cultivating fortitude and letting things go that really aren't important. And sometimes it's having the curiosity to find out what exactly does that person mean and not making assumptions. So the conclusion we want to arrive at when we reflect on the disadvantages of anger is that it is an emotion <coughs> that we will have, but it's not an emotion we need to act, it's not a place we want to act from. As spiritual practitioners, we want to learn how to calm ourselves down, understand our reaction, and then move forward from that place with wisdom and kindness. And we can do that. Well, on the plane last night, I decided to pick up the plan magazine. <laughs> and there's something actually useful in here that I want to share with you to end for tonight. I'm just stunned. Usually it's people getting 
you know, facelifts and plastic <laughs> surgery, and how to look younger and things like that. You know, get, get new teeth. Um, this is an article. Uh, this woman's name is Doris Turns Goodwin. She's a historian. Sure. Sure. Yeah? yeah. Goodwin. She's written about presidents yeah. in this country. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Beautiful book about Lincoln. Okay. So, you know, I was bored out of my mind last night. <laughs> but she's she's written this book, or she's done research her whole life about presidents in this country. And um, I'll read you two paragraphs. So it's not going to get real political. It's tying into the topic tonight. Okay. <laughs> So, the person interviewing her asks, what traits did these men share that helped them become better leaders? So here's an aspiration for the next few hours of people. Better leaders. So in her research she says, the common threads are the ability to build a team of strong-minded people who can argue with you and question your assumptions. That's actually the definition of a good Dharma friend, yeah. isn't it? 